During this session, we will gain perspective on bushfires and climate from the University of Tasmania's researchers, Dr. Rebecca Harris and Dr. Tom Remini. Dr. Harris is a senior lecturer in climatology in the discipline of geography and spatial science, as well as the director of the Climate Futures Program. She comes with over 20 years of research experience and her principal research interests are in the areas of conservation management and climate change impacts on natural and human systems. Dr. Tom Remini is a climate research fellow and part of the Climate Futures Program. He is passionate about translating high quality research into useful, usable products for organizations, governments, and the community, and has done extensive work with local governments in this space. During this interview, Tom and Beck will provide an update on the climate science and how the changing climate is impacting Tasmania. So without further ado, we'll jump straight into our first question, which is, just a little bit of a brief background on yourselves and the work that you're doing on climate and bushfires. Um, we can start with you, Tom. Okay, so um, my work is about taking high resolution climate information and taking, translating that into something people can use. So what does that mean? Well, as we might have already seen in the video, um, these models are four dimensional beasts. They, they are very difficult to just interpret as they are. They need to be summarized down into useful, useful ways. And so I talk to stakeholders about what they need. So in the bushfire space, I've been talking with local governments about and getting them to understand how the climate around them is changing. And so it's been a lot of engagement and in, in, in education of, of people in that space so they can then uh, figure out ways that they have to adapt their operations or where they need to invest in in their priority, prioritise their investments into the future. So I've been spending a lot of time in that space there and how that interacts with the finance and sectors and how local governments in Tasmania can better position themselves for the coming future. Fantastic. And Beck? I've been working in the, with bushfire ecology for lots of years. I started off thinking about bushfire ecology and how fire affects um, invertebrates and plants up in New South Wales. But for the last, I guess coming up for eight years now, I've been thinking about how climate change will affect fire, um, particularly in Tasmania. I was, I was, my, one of my first jobs was that I was, I was asked to think about how we would project or predict how fire will change in the future. And I said, sure, I can do that. Um, and then I started to break, the, break it all down. So ever since then, um, I've been working with various other people trying to break those components down. So if you think about the four switches that are needed to be turned on for a fire to happen, you've got fire weather, obviously, which is really important. You've got fuel availability. Um, and so that's obviously very much about thinking about vegetation and the... Um, distribution of vegetation across the landscape because that affects how fires travel and flammability uh, and then also ignition points which are very difficult to guess into the future. So we've been giving it a shot for a lot of those components in various parts. So we started off doing the original um, projections of fire weather with Paul Fox Hughes who was with the Bureau of Meteorology and that was in 2012 and that's the work where we um, looked at what those projections are just looking at the fire weather. And then I've also done some distribution modelling to think about how the vegetation chain type, types might change, um, how that might affect flammability. We have a, a colleague in Climate Futures who's spent a lot of time with fire spread models. So that's uh, Dr Peter Love, and he's been trying to think about how that might change into the future. And he's also been looking at lightning and how lightning ignitions might change um, into the future and whether or not that, when it coincides with a really dry soil layer and dry fuels that that might mean that we end up seeing more and more ignitions as we go into the future. In your short presentation you went over climate models and what trends we can expect going forward. Are you able to just offer a quick summary of, of that and what we can expect? Well the quickest summary is that it's going to get warmer and drier and uh, it's going to get warmer because temperatures are increasing. It's going to get drier because there's going to be less rain and also increased evaporation. And so really sort of over the entire landscape, that's true. 
at high elevations, it's in more intense than at lower elevations. And this is uh, a well, this is a, a phenomena that's been better understood um, over the last few years. Um, it's, it's real, it's being observed everywhere around the globe. Um, there is a relationship with, it, with elevations greater than a thousand meters particularly, um, are drying out um, at a much greater rate than, than those at lower elevations. And, it's, and that seems to be related also to the, the, higher, the increasing temperatures, which um, are more intense in those regions. Um, partly because of a decreasing coverage of snow and so then the overall temperatures are because there isn't as much reflected light it, it gets absorbed into the soils um, but that's that's only one part of the story so there's also an increasing temperature as the uh, snow line recedes so I think that's probably enough for the for just now how can councils and communities prepare knowing this and how are fire management approaches in Tasmania likely to evolve going forward with this information? Wow, that's quite a hard question. <laughs> um, so we, we did some research where we looked at the, the regional climate model output and we, the research happened because following on from that original work that looked at changing fire weather. So we, we found that yes, it is getting hotter and drier, the fire season will become more intense, um, come earlier and last for longer. And so we said, well, so what does that mean for the, the tools we have to manage fire across the landscape? And that's where we ended up with that hazard reduction burning. So in the media in the last, after the last 2020 bushfire season, that's been held up as being the answer. And it's a really easy knee jerk reaction to say, we just need to do more hazard reduction burning. And if we had done more, then we wouldn't have had these fires. I think that that's too simplistic an answer. And I think that that's not how we're gonna solve it going into the future because we, the, 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 the fire managers certainly in Tasmania, and I'm fairly sure they do it around the country, they already do as much hazard reduction burning as they can safely do. And that's limited by that, that window in winter and spring when the weather conditions are, are conducive to safe, low intensity burns. Um, and they're also constrained by the impacts of smoke on, on, you know, on human you know, cities and, and towns. Um, so they are gonna to have to become more reactive, I guess, and responsive to when those conditions are good, um, that they'll have to be able to jump out quickly, which they do try and do already. Um, I think they're also using some more imaginative um, techniques to try and look after assets. So for example, in Tasmania, in the Wil Wil Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, last summer in 2019, they, uh, use drip lines, irrigation drip lines around ec ecologically sensitive communities, the, the pencil pines, to try and make sure that they could stop the fire devastating those communities. They did things like wrapping up the um, huts that are of heritage significance in foil. Um, so these are sort of examples that are showing that really this is already happening now and they're having to be reactive and, and imaginative and trying to um, continue doing their jobs. I think in fact, a lot of the cases that they need to be able to plan based on their knowledge, rather than having to be told that they have to take, pick particular targets or do something else that's being driven by politics. But I think in the long run, we do end up hitting a, a limit to those sorts of management adaptation options. And we really do need to think about where we're building our cities and our towns. At the moment, we're continuing to, to build in areas that are incredibly vulnerable to fire. And that seems to be one of the ones that everyone agrees is has to change, but it's a really difficult one to change because of all of the, leg, the legal and, and governance and politics that surround it. And one of the, the key things that local governments are worried about is how they can manage uh, the, the increased um, exposure to their communities as we, we are are continuing to build into these more dangerous regions. They, they've identified this problem and they're trying to figure out mechanisms that they can implement throughout their, the council to, to support sensible development. And so that's, that's one of the things they are, they are struggling with and, and grappling with. There are tools that do exist through the, the federal, uh, sorry, through the state um, government system. Um, however, they, they are sort of difficult to, to implement at this stage for, for people on the ground. 
um, and it does require a lot of like rezoning and that's that's where the real adaptation happens is really about getting communities to recognize the risks and then those communities to accept that those zones are, are now out of bounds effectively for for development and that's a really big call because that means that a lot of people are, are have um, assets in those zones and, and you know so there's there's a big big challenge as to how these these things that are as a climate changes it's it's having winners and losers and um and that's that's where i think councils out on the ground are the ones seeing the um the friction that's there and so i think that's that's a big big thing for us to try and figure out how to manage and that's that's why adaptation is hard when tom talks about the on on the ground adaptation i i guess there are actually things that we can do and and the fire services are really working really closely with community and have been for many years to try and get people's houses more fire ready um, and that's things like you know clearing around your house making sure your gardens are clean and and they are spending a lot of time with communities to try and make us or help us take personal responsibility for protecting our own houses and lives and i think that's definitely been a change that we've seen in the last 10 years is a shift towards a shift away from trying to defend undefendable properties. And that means that we have more education to try and help us make those properties defendable, um, but also much faster evacuations um, under extreme bushfire weather. And then there's other, other sort of quite interesting things that are still sort of developing. There's people doing research into whether or not we can use green fire breaks instead of um, um, bulldozing things and, and having, having to continually update them. Things like having um, marsupial lawns and things like that that can actually build breaks between people's houses and, and surrounding forest. And people like Dave Bowman, Professor Dave Bowman at University of Tasmania is involved in some of that research. That leads on to the next question. Um, you, Beck, you talked about the temperatures are going to be changing going forward and areas in Tasmania that are now going to be predicted to experience fires that may have never experienced them before. Um, can you touch on what, where some of these communities might be and if they would already be taking on these practices that you mentioned or will it be a whole new sort of education piece? How can, how can they be prepared um, and should they be preparing now? Everywhere across Australia, everywhere across Tasmania is, is being affected by an increasing fire danger and fire risk. Some natural communities and some regions of Tasmania are more vulnerable or sensitive because they historically would not have been exposed to fire at all. So people are often very quick to say, oh, bushfire is natural in Australia. But of course, it's not natural for all ecosystems and all regions um, of the country or, or of Tasmania. So the Alpine areas are particularly vulnerable to increasing temperatures and bushfire, um, but also down in the Wilderness World Heritage Area, there are some um, populations of plants and animals that have been unchanged since Gondwana, which is a long, long time ago. So they're, they're, they're refugia of very old uh, populations, natural communities. So historically, they wouldn't have been exposed to fire or if they were, they would be exposed maybe every 400 years. So a fire might come through and then they'd have a long time to recover, to set seed, to build the population back up again. What we're seeing more and more now is that we're seeing repeated fires within three years or 10 years. So these individuals, for example, like a pencil pine um, atherotaxis species, they get killed by fire and they haven't got time to recover anymore. And we're seeing the same thing in the alpine communities where really slow growing plant communities are being repeatedly um, exposed to bushfires and not being get, given a chance to recover. So this is something that's a conversation that is gonna to have to go develop in the, in the future. National Parks and um, is trying to do things like I said earlier in terms of irrigation drip lines or wrapping up heritage listed huts whether or not those things are going to work into the future is is going to be we're going to have to see and they will and they'll need resources to do that so if we as a community decide that these things are important then we will have to um fund those those things because it's very expensive obviously particularly in really remote areas and as sort of beck alludes to um if those resources are not enough to save everything everywhere we're going to have to try and pick winners 
So, and that's, that's going to be really, really, a really challenging conversation because there's going to be particular ecosystems that we might not be able to save. And some of them are, this is the only place they are on the planet. And so those kind of discussions are things that are certainly happening inside the research community at the moment. And there's a like, you know, can we identify which ones are actually just going to be lost even by 2040, um, you know, I think that's that's really scary. Like we, we are locked in to a particular amount of climate change that'll continue until 2050. That is not going away. Even if we mitigate dramatically right now, there is, we are locked in to a particular amount of change until 2050. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. It's we're really trying to uh, um, mitigate the absolutely devastating changes that we're expecting to see, but to the end of century, if we follow this, this high emission scenario. And, um, yeah, and I think that that's a, that's a really sad conversation that's part of our, our everyday life. And we're aware of it, but I don't think that's really got through to a lot of people in the public just yet. I think we're still talking about a safe level of warming. And um, I think that with bushfire in particular, um, but also heat waves and droughts, um, I think we've already, for, certainly for natural communities, we've, some natural communities, we've already passed any safe level of warming. The IPCC's report on the 1.5 degrees um, in 2019 made the point that although we are locked into a certain amount of warming, as Tom says, every half a degree that we can prevent is a good thing and saves a lot of natural communities, saves a lot of human lives, saves a lot of money, um, and, and brings many benefits with it as well. Um, you know, if we, if we reduce our carbon emissions, we benefit by improved um, air quality, by increased biodiversity, we save a lot of money. So there are many reasons why we should be doing it and we can, be, we can do it, um, although we, we're not going to be able to avoid some of those impacts as we've seen in the last couple of summers with the bushfires. And, and, on, that, and on that mitigation thing too, I, I think it's important to recognise that there are, Tasmania is one of the leaders in the world for actually mitigating carbon emissions from activities of local councils. So Hobart City Council, Kingborough Council, Clarence, um, they've been very proactive in this space and are some of the, the nation and world leaders in how these kinds of changes, things that can be done on the ground, the adaptation that can be done, the mitigation that can be done. So we, we do have the expertise in our little part of the world to be able to implement this and roll it out across the state. Um, and that's really exciting. The other side is that there is so much more to do. And so that's a bit, you know, scary. Um, but we are well positioned here to be able to do as much as we can. And I think that shouldn't be lost um, in, you know, there is a, there is a, we have an enormous opportunity here to be the leaders and show everybody else in the world what can be done and how to do it. And, and, we're, we're leading the world on that. Um, is there a role for local government in driving that conversation, do you think? Uh, I think it's more about, it's less about them stepping up to it and more that it's coming to them all the time. So they are already living through this. Um, the council um, personnel who are interacting with the public every day are already having to answer questions about you know, what developments they're allowed to go ahead and, you know, um, be they really large developments or be they just, you know, uh, subdividing a single block. You know, th these kinds of questions are actually already happening. And so I think it's more about how can local, local councils really get on top of it and have a united front in terms of the way that they address it. Make sure they have the same frameworks um, that allow the diversity across the, the landscape to be recognised, but to have the same kind of approach in responding. And there are, there are efforts inside local governments to try and coordinate that at the moment, especially through organisations like the Southern Tasmanian Council's Authority. And so there is efforts there. Um, it's just about getting that coordination up to that, that sort of national level. And I think the fact is that the, the conversation will be different in every local council. Um, this is about values, you know, we know, we know the science and the science is grim um, and then there's an economic layer and a political layer which is about how many resources a community is prepared to spend on assets versus a natural community 
some of those things are going to be out, out of the control of a local council. Um, sometimes there will be legislation that means that they have to try and save an endangered species, for example, um, that will be driven by state or, or federal um, act. But certainly the conversation will be wildly different depending on where you are. And it's, but it's a, I, th I personally think it's one we're still avoiding a little bit. Um, and I think partly it's because in many people's minds, climate change is a problem of the future that we've got a bit of time to think about. Um, but I think that that has changed a lot, particularly after the 2020 bushfires on the, on the mainland, which saw an unprecedented amount of, of forest burn that historically, like in the World Heritage Area in Tasmania, would not have burned. Um, and I, so I think that conversation is really going to start in the next few years. It's a difficult one, though. Your presentation touched on some of the impacts that the changing climate and bushfires are having. Um, are there any other ones that you didn't touch on that you'd like to elaborate on? We're releasing um, Australia's Wine Future, a wine atlas, uh, next week. And part of our, discuss our development of that project over the last four years has been engagement with, with the wine industry. And smoke impacts on, on wine grapes is a really big issue. It, devastated some of the some of the um, crop throughout the Huon Valley a couple of years ago and so this is this is an in an example of how smoke can impact on uh, land, the landscape well outside of the fire um, fire zone itself and in that same year we also had impacts of smoke on, on Hobart and um, the impacts on, on asthmatics and you know the general kind of um, impacts on human health that were, were, were really bad and we've just had some reports out of the Royal Commission in the last couple of days actually um, saying you know over 400 people died because of smoke um, impacts on the major cities of, of Melbourne and Sydney so um, so I think that's that's a really big one uh, that sort of we haven't had a chance to touch on um, and there are, there are other things that kind of get exposed as well and I'll hand over to Beck for, for those. I was just going to add on that the, the impact of smoke also limits the ability to do ability to do the hazard reduction burning. So the the fire managers have to wait for the perfect weather conditions so that they can do their their management burns, their hazard reduction burning in such a way that the smoke doesn't fill up the valley and um, cause big issues for asthmatics. So it really does, you know, the the window of appropriate weather is becoming narrower as the climate becomes hotter and drier and then on top of that you've got issues with smoke so that again reduces that um, ability to use that as, as the main tool for managing fire across the landscape. So let's continue talking about these these impacts. Um, Tom you do a lot of work on what they mean in terms of risk um, and why it's so essential to have these conversations and factor these risks into business and government. Can you explain a little bit about this work and how it impacts local government? So the work I do is always about trying to assess the frequency and intensity of a particular climate hazard. And then that has to go through a layer of, so what is being exposed to that hazard? So, you know, if you if sea level rises and it is a, is a risk, for example, if you're not on the coast, it's not a risk, it's, it's not a hazard. So, so it's really about making sure that those spatial um, components as it's the concern, and then, and we, and then identify how important it is to them, um, that particular climate hazard or that particular suite of climate hazards. So I talk with them um, about the, this particular, the, the kind of looking at climate change and then the associated hazards that come with that. And then with that, thinking about what's that mean for their risk disclosure when they're talking to insurers um, and the insurers are starting to ask those questions more. I, I am aware of some local councils have actually had discounts on their insurance because Tasmania has actually been on the forefront of high resolution climate information and translating that into, into things that are useful for, for local government. And insurers have responded well to that saying, well, that means you know about your risk and you actually have steps in place to try and address it. And that's, that's the important part for, for local government really is it's, it's that interaction with, with managing their assets and managing that insurance risk. 
And recently what's happened is there's been a movement internationally to really get uh, these, this, uh, the executive leadership teams to understand that the risk really does sit with them to manage. And that's been a really big change over the last two years. And that's for every organisation. And so local governments are no different. They need to be aware of the fact that now the market, the, the business community, banks who might lend money, insurers that cover assets, um, investors who might be interested in coming into a particular location to set up their business, they want to have um, certainty around what it is that will happen in, in that environment and understanding the climate hazard is one part but then also understanding what their local government is going to do to help support um, particular activities inside that area is something that's happening as well so when I talk about hazard it starts to get kind of start moving into that socio-economic space um, and that's where I have to liaise with a lot of my colleagues um, to, to really get that that expertise but it's about trying to most of the work at the moment is about getting the local government members, the councillors, and then the executive leadership teams, and even down to the personnel, the, um, the operational staff level, to understand how critical it is for them to be on top of their climate-related risks and understand where climate is really hitting, the rubber's hitting the road in terms of either impacts or in terms of what types of adaptation and mitigation they should be prioritising. And it, it does go through the entire organisation. This is not a, it's not the environment officer who needs to do this job. It's, it's actually like, you know, the business, business management team need to start allocating resources. They, it's the, it's the um, roads, and, uh, roads and footpaths and, and uh, you know, the uh, wastewater management teams. They need to be really aware of the, the challenges. And, and, there are many fantastic individuals across across the councils in, in um, Tasmania who are well aware of this and have been thinking about it for a long time. So we do have some of the expertise in this space locally that we can we can leverage off. And I would encourage anyone who's interested or worried to actually reach out and try and find those people because they're, they're, they're there and they want to help. Let's talk about if you have any examples of, of leading councils doing great things in response to bushfires. Hobart City Council coordinated a, an engagement with Fern Tree, the Fern Tree community, a couple of years ago. It's one of the most inspiring, um, inspiring events that I've ever been involved with. So I, I got to go along as the climate change expert. I was able to say, here's what's going to happen to the climate drivers of fire. And Professor, uh, Professor Dave Bowman got to present about here's the actual, how fire dynamics change in this particular landscape. Then Taz Fire said, here is where our responsibility lies and here are the resources that we have in the, like that are available for communities to access all the time um, so they can be prepared for fire. And then Hobart City Council said, and here's where our responsibilities lie. And then when once that was all done, there was a discussion about, and here's where the community's responsibility is. This is the part that we can't get involved with, managing your own property. And the Fern Tree community responded incredibly well to that. Um, those people that weren't willing to live with that risk anymore, um, like six houses went on the market the, the week after the presentation, um, whereas people identified that they, they weren't willing to, to manage that risk or live with that risk any, any longer. Um, then there were um, the rest of the community said, okay, well, what do we have to do to make, make this environment something that's safer for at, at least to a particular level of fire? So not necessarily to a catastrophic day, but certainly to a, you know, more of those severe risk days that you, we can actually help prevent fire spread. And there's been an enormous amount of work going on. Uh, I used to live up there and uh, it's been wonderful to see how the um, understories have been really kind of cleared out of, of debris, um, of fuel um, over the last few years. And I think it's a, a great example of the community saying, well, we want to live here. We want to make it safer for us. Um, we understand that when it's a total fire ban, we, we need to pack a bag, pack the cat and down, you know, go down to the beach for the day. Um, and they've started to do that more often and really implement those sort of um, adaptation responses. 
And I think I think they're a real leading community um, in Australia that, that other communities could say, well, what what could we do? How how could we um, change our ways? Just to add on to that, um, Tom, I think it's really important to recognise also that we are getting a lot better at understanding fire, what causes fire, why it spreads in such a way as it does. Um, the fire managers have funded research and now incorporated into their modelling and their approaches, um, which means that they can respond really quickly when they find an ignition. Um, and they're much, and they're just getting, and they use a lot of these tools operationally. So even though, of course, they get a little bit of uh, criticism when their fire models might be slightly not exactly right, in fact, they actually are really, really good. And they can incorporate a lot of the, the really good weather forecasting with their fire models. And they're really onto it. So I think we are getting better, and I think we're getting better at understanding when we can fight a fire and when we can't. So you raised the point of, you know, take the cat down to the beach. We're all getting better at that from the community level up, and, uh, and it saves lives. Lastly, um, to both of you, are there any overall messages to councils based on your knowledge of past and predicted fire behaviour that you want to lead? Sort of any last parting, parting thoughts, really? The increasing risk is, is dramatic. It cannot be underestimated. And we've already seen how, how difficult it can be for a community to manage these risks with, say, what's happened in the Huon Valley over the last couple of years and what's happened in Denali prior to that. And when these, have, when these risks come through, the local, and local councils are aware of these risks. Like they are aware of bushfire being a risk. But it's the frequency that really worries Beck and I, both the impact on the environment, the impact on the, on the, the economy that, that, that carries with this. And I think we need to really start thinking in a different way around how this is not something that's going to be, we're just managing a single event. It, it's, we are now managing a fundamental change to the way we have to live in our landscape. And I think, that's a really scary thing to have to try and get across and, and to, to even think about. And so I think, I think that's the real message is, is it, it really, we really need to have a, little, a lot more discussion and a lot more really big ideas as to what, what do we want our communities to look like moving forward and how can we keep them safe and how can we make them resilient to this ever increasing risk of bushfire into the future. I guess I would just uh, agree with everything that Tom said. Um, I think we just have to have a really detailed conversation about what we're going to do moving forward, find the things that we can change, and there are some things that we can change, whether that's making our houses prepared, taking personal responsibility for fire danger, um, through to things that council can do and the state government can do. Um, but if we don't have that conversation, then we're sort of flying blind into a future that we do know is going to be a much greater fire risk. So I think that we have to have that conversation from the ground up, from the community, through the local councils, and we have to keep having it, and it will be slightly different in different councils. But um, it's really important to get the, the community on board to start taking some responsibility for this.